In 1933, Adolf Hitler's Germany began establishing concentration camps for the incarceration of those who Nazi policy dubbed subversives. The SS created large camps including Dachau, where tens of thousands were imprisoned. After Germany invaded Poland, the camp system was expanded across Europe. In 1942, the implementation of the final solution was established at the Wannsee Conference, calling for extermination of the Jewish people. Several camps, including Treblinka, Belzic, Sebibor, were created as death camps for the systematic murder of Jews and others. Most of the camps in the extensive system continued to use slave labor to serve the German war effort. Conditions were brutal and prisoners were frequently worked to death. Typhoid and other diseases ran rampant. As the war limited Germany's resources, prisoners were denied food or medical care. Some were subjects of bizarre and grotesque medical experiments. In July 1944, Soviet troops liberated the first camp at Madnik. In January of 1945, Auschwitz was liberated. Americans first saw the camps when they liberated Orduf on April 4, 1945. The horrors of what these soldiers witnessed far surpassed any rumors they may have heard. Virtually no one at the camp was alive. The SS had left the camp taking the prisoners capable of walking on a forced march. What remained were thousands of bodies. The next day, the American liberated Dora Nordhausen. There, alongside the piles of corpses, were several thousand survivors in an unimaginably poor state. Those that were not sick were walking skeletons near starvation. As Yiddish speakers, the Jewish-American liberators were often the only ones able to communicate with the survivors. Almost immediately, they attempted to begin re-establishing the Jewish community the Nazis had tried to destroy. This was repeated with larger groups of survivors at Dachau and Buchenwald. Though it was a small step in the context of the horrors of the Holocaust, the role these American Jewish soldiers played was incredibly significant. The impact on the liberators was lasting. Memories of witnessing the Holocaust impacted their entire lives. Imagine, the time is 1945. More than 70 years ago, the place is any of hundreds of Nazi concentration, slave labor, and death camps throughout Europe. Imagine you're a Jew, or maybe you're a gypsy, or anyone else who the Third Reich dictates must be systematically eliminated, but not until the last ounce of strength has been squeezed from your body through slave labor. What? Did you hear the camp rumor? It is that the Americans and the Soviets are approaching the camp. Suddenly the Allied soldiers are here. They're Americans, they're Soviets, Partisanis, Polish underground, others. They're Asians, my goodness. They're Japanese in American uniforms, even while their, their families are being interred in camps that we hear in the United States. Wait a minute, I think I hear somebody speaking Yiddish. One of the American soldiers says, Ich bin ein Yid. Is it possible that we are free and that some of those who have freed us are actually Jews in American uniforms? Oh my God, we are saved. Please watch and listen to the personal stories of some of those World War II veterans, liberators of all kinds, Jews, Christians, and others, who in this video recall their real life experiences and feelings and thoughts of when they freed the captives. Suddenly we started to get some fire from the towers. We brought the tanks up, knocked the towers off, proceeded down the road and had the tanks bust through the gates of we didn't know what. We all looked at each other, what in the freaking, what is that stink? At the gate, there were two, there were two brick columns 
with a wrought iron fence greeting over the two columns. It said that in German, it said, work means freedom. And then there was a, there was a gate that, that the, we knocked down. And went. So we went in through the gate. Some of my 33 or 36 box cars were loaded with bodies. You could smell the, the burning of the flesh. I wasn't quite sure of where, where I was and what I was doing, other than I knew I was somewhere in the Nordhausen vicinity. It turned out to be a camp where the people working in the camp were working in a munitions factory not too far from there, up towards Nordhausen. When entering that camp was uh, the most horrific sight I've ever seen or ever hoped to see the rest of my life. On the left, there were piles of skeletal-like bodies. On the right, the same thing. When I say skeletal-like, I mean skeletal-like. Bones with no flesh piled on top of each other. Those who were alive were so emaciated it defies description. I don't think any of them could have weighed more than 50, 60, 70 pounds. I remember seeing people coming toward me look like zombies. Uh, all I remember seeing like broomsticks for arms and legs, no flesh, all bones, cheeks hollowed out. Uh, uh, and we had seen combat. Uh, I had seen dead bodies, but nothing like this. These were civilians. The, the ovens were still hot. We saw the, the members of the concentration crawling out, some of them still burning on the deal, and they would immediately want to grab a hold of the guards and shove them into the ovens. We had to prevent that. The pit, about 25 feet across, about 75 feet long, and the depth, God only knows. But right to the top, there was these poor, emaciated, naked individuals were stacked in there. It was partly covered with, with lime, but the I guess the Germans didn't have enough time to cover the rest of it, but there they were for all to see. A fence, barbed wire, and people. They were slaves. He said they were all Jewish. They were making shells for the 88s for Germany. The smells, there were two dead people that they had piled. They were eating the dogs and the cats. and It was just, just a terrible sight to see our people being treat, treated like that. In my broken Yiddish and, and German, I said, it's been a Yid, and all oh, the, the smiles broke out and so on. And I said, well, can we do to help you now? There will be other people come down to help you. My men gave me whatever rations we were carrying with us. Uh, we had liberated some wine, and we had a little kiddish. And I didn't really know what to do. And finally, I said, uh, would you all like to say the Kaddish? So we said the Kaddish. Everybody was clad in these pajamas with black and gray stripes. So they were frightened. And I, I said, Hutnish Kane Angst, this is I, Yiddish Hunt. And I, they still were afraid. And then Chaplain Bolin said, Ich bin <clears throat> That's all he's good. Ich bin an Americana Rabbina. I am an American rabbi. It's as if all of the emotions had been unleashed. There was wailing and People came over to us and kneeled and kissed our hands. They started to kiss me and say, Danke, Danke, Americana, Yuda, American, Jew, Yuda, Yuda, Americana. And he was crying, and then I started to cry, and, but, but he made eye contact with me, looking at me. Why did they want to kill me? Why did they do this to me? Why did they want to kill me just because I'm Jewish, just because I'm Jewish? Why did they do this over and over again? And I, and I, I didn't know what to say at first, and then his head went down. Like, and the medic gave me the, the no pulse sign. He had no pulse. He died. 
They send in the Jewish troops to console them, if they could speak Yiddish, to talk to them, to give them hope. And I saw these walking skeletons, and to this day it frightens me, the memory of, the, of this. It was awful. I tried in my limited Yiddish, but uh, I was crying, I guess, and I wasn't much good to them to, to, to cry in front of them, but I guess them knowing the ye, ye pointing to myself and uh, might have given them some hope. I saw that little Jewish fella uh, in a corner, weeping and wailing. And in Yiddish, I went over to him and tried to get him straightened out, which I think I did. I told him, yes, I told him, yes, an American Yiddish is sold out. So, you know, he looked around, he was amazed. And uh, that's how it started. And then he started weeping and wailing, wailing, and he, you know, all this kaput, all this forlorn. I tried to calm him, I didn't know what to do. So he was sitting there waiting, and I, we had had a firefight with some SS two days before. I had a pile of money in my pocket, about fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, in a big wad, big enough to choke a horse. I pulled it out, and I put it in his jacket, in the pocket of his jacket. He grabbed my hand, and he said in Yiddish, he said, you, can't, you, can't ask, uh, you can't take this because it's not proper. I have nothing to give you in exchange. I was so overwhelmed, I almost cried right then and there. And so I saw the badge on his, on his uniform, you know, which is a piece of tin attached with a safety pin to the, to the uniform, and a linen on top of this tin with his name Beauty on it. And that's what I brought back home. That's one of the best deals I ever made. Financially, it was a $15,000 for a piece of tin. Financially, it was, of course, no deal, but, but morally and emotionally, it was the best deal I ever made in my life. Sometimes you don't wake up screaming, but sometimes you have nightmares about the thing. It was it was just so horrific. It's every time I talk about it, I can visualize some of these things, and uh, that's why I couldn't talk about it. It was too it was too horrible to try to remember. It left a mark on me. Uh, what I saw there it left a mark in my heart, my soul. I wish I could get rid of the mark, but I can't. I can't get rid of the mark. Uh, I say to myself over and over again, I continue to say it, why did the free world, why did the civilized world let something like this happen? I was there for about three or four hours. Well, I, was, I became very strong Zionist. I knew there was no other answer but Zionism, and because I, I saw what can happen to a people, a whole people, in a very short time, five to six years, it wiped out six million Jews. In the months following liberation, many liberators stayed in Europe to help survivors. After the basic needs of food and medicine for survivors were met, many Americans worked to find family members of the survivors in the U.S. Some helped to try to find ways to emigrate to Palestine. In the displaced persons camps, American Jewish military chaplains acted as civilian rabbis, conducting services, weddings, and bar mitzvahs for survivors. Though the conditions were still difficult in these camps, liberators worked alongside the survivors to ensure that Jewish life and community could survive. The relationships between survivors and liberators sometimes lasted a lifetime. Reunions filled with both joy and sorrow continue to this day. In 1948, with the founding of the State of Israel, the Jewish survivors remaining in the displaced persons camps finally had a home to go to, and the experience of liberation was complete. We celebrate the 70th anniversary of the liberation of the Nazi death camps by World War II veterans, Jew and Gentile alike, U.S. and Allies, and we honor those veterans who liberated those camps and freed the captives. These are truly of the greatest generation. Those inmates who managed to survive were the nidus from which the State of Israel was born, the Holocaust, the catalyst for that great rebirth after 2,000 years. The pioneers, these halutzim, displaced persons, survivors of the death camps, were the quotes, germinal seed of a new Jewish buildup, 
end quotes, as prophesized by Heydrich himself in the original Wannsee Conference for Nazi Planners of the Final Solution to the Jewish Question. We celebrate the future by honoring the liberators. Hope springs eternal, and the Jew is eternal.